My name is Severina McGill and I teach at Jindal Global Law School. This module is for the UGC Epathshala. This module will explore the feminist generation of rights number two. By the end of this module, you will have knowledge of branches of feminist theory not covered in the previous module. This module will examine cultural feminism, radical feminism and Dalit feminism. The following module will be on black feminism within the USA. By the end of this module, you will have knowledge of theories that have developed the concepts of intersectional discrimination and highlight the experiences of women in specific groups. We will also explore what the theories represent, when they were developed and why they were developed. In addition to the three generations of feminist legal theory covered in the previous module, equality feminism, difference feminism and intersectional feminism, there are many other forms of feminism that have evolved simultaneously, which are not covered within this module. Other forms of feminism include socialist feminism, eco-feminism, post-structural feminism, trans feminism. There is also arguably a fourth wave of feminism happening now, where women are demanding more rights over their own bodies, such as personal life lifestyle decisions, free from judgment by society and the state, regardless of how politically correct they may be. These decisions could include having a freer lifestyle and sexual choices without interference from the government or society, such as the choice to marry or not marry, to not want to become a parent, to have open or polyamorous relationships, and to have more autonomy over women's bodies. As this new generation of feminism argues for greater independence of women, it has been referred to as I-feminism. This module will explore three specific forms of feminism and their theories. By the end of the module, you will be more familiar with the need for multiple representations of feminism, how these are beneficial to the communities they represent. Carol Gilligan's writings on the ethic of care and the ethic of rights aim to demonstrate that men and women think in different ways. She argues that men work on a system of rights, typically between two individuals who are of similar status, whereas women have a system of care to understand and explain social relationships which are more complex. Gilligan used her experience as a psychiatrist to conduct social experiments to give a basis to the theory of cultural feminism. She relied on a study that asked both boys and girls a hypothetical question to highlight sociological differences between men and women's thinking and how men and women engage differently with both social relationships and the legal system. The question was whether Heinz could steal a medicine that he couldn't afford to buy from a chemist to cure his dying wife. The boy answered yes and the girl was less certain. The boy justified his answers saying that a human life is worth more than money. In other words, if the chemist had the medicine that was unaffordable, there was a right to access it, for example, the property or asset, to save a life. He also reasoned that the crime of theft was lesser than the consequence of someone dying, and that even if the case of theft went to court, the judge would probably think it was the right thing to do. When the girl answered, she was less sure if there was a clear answer. Initially, the girl feels Initially, the girl feels alone or borrowing some of the money for the drug would be the best solution, but she says that the boy really shouldn't steal the drug. Whilst explaining her answer, the girl thought of potential consequences. If he stole the drug, he might save his wife then, but if he did, he might have to go to jail and then his wife might get sicker again and he wouldn't be able to buy more of the drug and it might not be helpful for the long-term solution. So the girl stated that they really should just talk uh, about the situation and try to find a way to raise the money. Gilligan argued that girls and women engage with their immediate and extended society in a more holistic way than boys and men. She argued that girls and women are more concerned about how their actions will affect not only themselves and their friends and family and others in close proximity to the situation within a short period of time, but also about how other people within society may be affected over a prolonged period of time. This different way of thinking affects how women and men engage with the situation and the world around them, and this is including the legal system. The basis for cultural feminism 
is to develop a deeper understanding of the difference between the way men and women think about the concept of rights and to recognize that the current design of the legal system is inherently male. The discussions in this generation consist of debates on how the different voice of women, which consists of the importance of human relationships and for a most positive outcome for the most people involved as possible, can be better represented within law. Cultural feminism focuses on the identification and restoration of the point of view and qualities which have been deemed to be specific to women. Essentially, it's a standpoint theory. It emphasizes the reduced position of women and allows them to make more complete and accurate accounts of society and women's lives within the context of what would be more preferable morally and scientifically instead of the decisions and structures dominated by men. The children in the study were also asked to define responsibility. The boy said that for him, responsibility means not doing what he wants to do because he is thinking of others. Whereas for the girl, it meant doing what others are counting on her to do, regardless of what she herself wants. Gilligan concluded that men operate with a system of rights, such as to not steal because someone is entitled to keep their property. If, however, someone had multiple assets and someone had no assets, boys could justify taking one asset as it would be a fairer distribution where each should have a right to some of the assets. Their arguments are therefore formed using an adversarial framework of two people with equal rights who can take from one another within reason, for example, fairness. The girls interviewed had longer, more complicated answers. Their answers considered not only the two characters who had and or needed assets, but also those that could benefit and be negatively affected by any potential reallocation of these assets and how this would affect a wider group of their dependents. Women, therefore, mostly speak the language of care, whilst men speak the language of rights. Whilst the ethic of care works well for certain women, it does not work well for all women in society. Not every woman has the same manner of thinking, not all women are maternal, and some men may be more socially sympathetic than others. Gilligan's theory feeds into the stereotypes of the image of a woman as being a caring, nurturing mother with few needs of her own. It also reinforces the idea of a woman largely being a non-independent being who is dependent upon her family, thus representing and reinforcing male domination. Further, Gilligan's study also identified that within the original psychiatric study of the children's answers, the boys' answers were given more value by the assessors than the girls' answer. The boys' answer was credited as being more direct, straightforward, easy to understand, and as demonstrating greater clarity. The girl's answer was seen as being less clear, less relevant, less easy to understand, and less proficient. This, Gilligan argues, demonstrates the gendered imbalance, lack of understanding, and lack of value that women's voices receive in the public sphere. Radical feminism believes that the very structure of law and rights, as it exists today, has been written by men to regulate behavior and to benefit other men. It therefore states that the entire concept of rights and the legal system needs to be dismantled and rebuilt to reflect women and men more equally. Catherine McKinnon is recognized as being a leading radical feminist theorist. For McKinnon, radical feminism points out the differences between men and women in a manner that legitimizes discrimination in certain walks of life. According to some radical feminists, the difference, for example, of pregnancy between men and women is considered as an exception to real equality and is not actually a part of law at all. This is one area of law that the legislating bodies accept that there is something valid enough to create separate laws about. The situation of pregnancy is therefore seen in terms of how things are taught in a medical school. Everyone learns things about the human body but the specialization in the female body is termed differently as obstetrics and gynecology. This is because at some level, McKinnon argues, the male body is considered to be the norm and the female body is considered as an exception. 
Radical feminists criticized the equality approach by saying that in order to get the benefits that men get in society, a woman has to act like a man as the system has not been created or structured in a representative way. Radical feminism has explained the inequality faced by women as a product of male dominance of women. According to them, inequality is political and sexual in nature. Radical feminism is a standpoint theory as to the position of women in society and takes a completely different view than other theories of its generation. The problem that McKinnon has with her structure of law is that women are either the same as or different from the male norm that society has been built upon. To demonstrate that the legal system is male-centric and does not represent women, radical feminism suggests that the very nature of the adversarial court system works on the premise of one person's rights being deemed more important than another person's claim by the same court. This determination of one winner to a legal case and, as a necessary consequence, one loser too, does not reflect the ethic of care, the consideration of the outcome for others and the shared rights to something or the best outcome for multiple people and not just the petitioner and the defendant. Radical feminists argue that this does not reflect women's way of thinking. One way to achieve greater representation of the ethic of care within the current legal system would be to rely more on dispute resolution and mediation. This, however, although being occasionally used to resolve disputes, does not currently hold the same social value or status as court judgments, despite often being in both parties' interests. Many radical feminists want the entire system of law taken apart and remade from the point of view that benefits women as equally as men. The reasoning is that they feel equality is not achievable in the present system of law. Despite theories having a lot of support, radical feminism promotes the dismantling of existing legal systems as, it, as they exist today. Due to the unlikeliness that the legal system will ever be entirely dismantled and restructured, and the failure of radical feminism to suggest more likely and cooperative suggestions, its credibility has been weakened as a strategy to encourage real, effective, lasting change that is likely to take place. Radical feminism has therefore been labelled as extreme and unachievable, and therefore not a practical form of feminist legal theory or reform to create a more representative system of rights. Despite criticisms regarding radical feminism, especially when it was first promoted in the 1990s, if we look at equality law today within human rights, we often see that academics such as Sandra Fredman actually promote the recognition of disadvantage that certain groups of society has experienced, the redressal of that discrimination and disadvantage, and they promote the need for women and other minorities such as religious, racial, non-heterosexual or disabled persons to be better accommodated within social structures. Fredman argues that it is only when people are better accommodated within these structures that transformative equality of real representation of diverse opinions will be met. There are therefore significant similarities between the two methods. Within India, women, and especially Dalit women, have been fighting against discrimination for centuries. Hindu scriptures, especially the Manusmriti, define both lower castes and women as impure, polluting and subject to detailed regulation. Upper caste women were vulnerable to violence and oppression largely because of both of their caste status and their sex. It was also because of their proximity to assets and land. If widowed, upper caste women were largely subjected to enforced widowhood. They had their head shaved, were stripped of their jewellery, forced to only wear white clothing and were often denied nutritious, well-flavoured food in the interests of controlling their sexual passions. In some circumstances, widows were also subjected to forced pregnancy from family members. This was co to largely control inheritance claims. They were also forced to live their remaining years in temples dedicated to widows where they were vulnerable to poverty, living only from the donations to the temple 
and forms of sexual violence from men in positions of power and authority, or, in some extreme cases, they were forced to commit sati. Thus, when Fule and his wife Savitri Bai opened a home in 1854 for upper caste widows who faced intimate violence ranging from physical abuse and impregnation, they were actually criticizing Brahminical order that sanctioned such practices, even as they were challenging up the upper caste capacity to protect their women. Dalit women have for centuries been fighting oppression from patriarchy and men within their caste group, as well as fighting violence and oppression from members of upper caste groups who are socio-economically more powerful and from colonial occupiers. Dalit women, therefore, have a long history of fighting against their marginalization on the basis of their gender, caste and class position. Being Dalit, Dalit women suffer due to caste discrimination and being a woman, they are more likely to be victimized by the patriarchal social order both in their homes as well as outside. The efforts of Savitri Bai and Fule were not alone in campaigning for change. Social reformers such as Periyar also fought for changes to the caste structure and for women's rights. Women's education was taken up and there were hesitant steps forward on other issues of women's rights as well. But these were always argued for in terms of the needs of reformed men for better family atmospheres. Independent women activists such as Padnita Ramabai, Tarabai Shindi and Anadibai Joshi were nearly all marginalized simply for being women. During colonialism, European powers came to India and established colonial rule. White men came to India as governors and high-ranking officials and sought other men to perform lower-ranking administrative functions. These roles had status as they came with recognition of their administrative labor, which was rewarded with salaries. Just like colonial powers only brought European women to colonies as appendages and unnecessary appendages as far as governance was concerned, similarly, local women were also granted no status and they were seen as subordinate and completely unnecessary for local administration. The division of status between the local population on the basis of caste and sex was also affected, and this is something which has continued post-colonialism. Myers's study, as cited by Mohanty, examined social roles, status, and economic labor in a town that had lace making as an industry in the 1970s. Myers states that at the beginning of the lace making industry, local roles within society were largely defined by caste. But as capitalism and the market economy increased, roles were divided on the basis of caste and gender. Originally, Hindu Kapu men and women were agricultural laborers, and it was the lower caste Harijan or Dalit women who were lace makers. As lace making began to offer higher profits, upper caste men started to represent the industry and engage in exporting lace and marketing it. Kapu women then started producing the lace within the home, free from the public gaze. Since purdah and the seclusion of women is a sign of higher caste status, the domestication of Kapu labourer women where their lace-making activity was tied to the concept of purdah, it was entirely within the logic of capital accumulation and profit. As Kapu women moved into the lace-making industry, Dalit women were pushed into agricultural roles with less status, harsher conditions and less remuneration. This case study demonstrates how upper caste men pushed women into the homes to reinforce their own roles and newly acquired status, and consequently also had exclusive access to the trading relationships and monetary rewards it offers, primarily from women's production. Within groups of women, the study also demonstrates that even when a particular caste group has historical experience of performing a particular trade, once trade structures evolve and such skills become more economically and socially valuable, upper caste women are able to usurp lower caste women from their traditional roles and push them into agricultural roles in their own pursuit of social mobility. This demonstrates how women become marginalized within their own groups 
and how Dalit women experience a double burden or marginalization, being outcast from their roles and subjected to harsher working lives. Dalit women's vulnerability may therefore be seen as, in each minority community, there exists minorities within minorities. The women who suffer additionally on account for their gender, and in this case, because of their caste as well. Since the 1980s and 1990s, feminist campaigns to increase women's recognition and inclusion within social structures have become more representative of difference, with both black and Dalit feminist organizations coming into existence. It must be noted, however, that these groups emerged partly because of their proximity to the issues they represented, but crucially, because dominant feminist movements failed to embrace nuanced issues of representation. As Sharmila Reggie notes, this was shown in their, the feminist movements' restraint in appropriating voice of black and third world women, and that their silence presumes that the sole responsibility of combating racism is that of the black feminists. Likewise, issues of caste became the sole responsibility of Dalit women organizations. Whilst marginalized women's issues had been recognized by the mainstream feminist movement in India, for example, campaigns surrounding both the rape of a 14-year-old tribal girl and the rape of the lower caste social worker Banvari Devi, the Mathura and Vishaka rapes respectively, most of the campaigns failed to recognize the daily struggles and realities of Dalit women and failed to include members from the group within their organizations. Ruth Manorama was one Dalit feminist who vehemently questioned the feminist mainstream movement and questioned their neglect of the caste question and social justice for Dalit women. In 1993, Manorama founded the National Federation of Dalit Women. Shortly after, in 1995, the Dalit Mahinga Sangatana was formed by Dalit women in Maharashtra. In the 1990s, international NGOs were also beginning to recognize caste discrimination as an international issue, and this enabled Dalit women's organizations to play a larger role in furthering recognition of their realities. It was in the 1990s that Dalit women's organizations articulated the intersectional oppression of Dalit women as Dalits oppressed by upper caste groups, Dalits generally and agricultural workers specifically subject to class oppression, mainly at the hand of upper caste landowners, and Dalit women facing patriarchal oppression at the hands of all men, including men from their own caste. By 2001, when the World Conference Against Racism, Racial Discrimination and Xenophobia and Related Intolerance took place in Durban, South Africa, Dalit organizations were organized enough to promote awareness of their marginalized position. This was despite significant resistance from the Indian government. For example, the Indian government denied international human rights workers, academics and researchers visas to enter the country to meet with local Dalit NGOs to collect data before attending the conference. And the Indian government refusing to acknowledge caste as a form of identity inherited on the basis of dissent, and therefore subject to human rights law obligations to redress. This is a position the government maintains even today. Uma Chakravarti notes that though women's subordination is a feature of all societies around the world, the extent of this subordination and oppression is conditioned by the social and cultural environment of every society. She notes a marked feature of Hindu society is the legal sanction for an extreme expression of social stratification in which women and the lower castes have been subjected to humiliating conditions of existence. She identifies caste hierarchy and gender hierarchy as the interconnected organizing principles of the Brahminical social order. According to the National Human Rights Commission, widespread custodial torture and killing of Dalits, rape, and sexual assault of Dalit women and looting of Dalit property by the police are condoned or at best ignored. Further, as Dalits increasingly organize to protest their discriminatory treatment and to claim their rights, the government has consistently failed to protect Dalits against retaliatory attacks by upper caste groups, 
including the rape of Dalit women, and has failed to address social and economic boycotts against Dalits, thereby further discouraging integrationist movements. Dalit women may be branded as witches and blamed for certain mishaps in the community. Aside from the humiliation of being branded as a witch, Dalit women are also punished for these mishaps. For example, by being made to eat feces and drink urine, by having their teeth pulled out, and by having chili pepper put into their eyes and other bodily orifices. They are also often beaten severely enough to result in their death. The National Campaign on Dalit Human Rights has also claimed that every hour, two Dalits are assaulted, every day, three Dalit women are raped, and every day, two Dalits are murdered. They also state that every day, two Dalit houses are burnt down. In August 2017, a 40-year-old Dalit woman named Kanya Devi was tortured and died as a result of her injuries in Rajasthan. Kanya, who had been widowed just a month before, had a minor son, and was allegedly branded a witch, stripped naked, paraded around her village, physically assaulted, and made to eat faecal matter. She was also forced to walk on embers, which were shoved into her eyes that blinded her. Kanya was also mercilessly beaten up with hot ro iron rods. There were extensive burn injuries on her legs, thighs, and other parts of her body. When the murder of Kanya became known, the local Karp Panchayat held a meeting and decided to absolve the accused of the crime by recommending that they immerse themselves in the Pushka waters, pay a fine of rupees 2,500 each, and pay for fodder for local cows. An FIR was not filed about her murder and death until activists and the media became involved. Whilst no motive has been confirmed, activists have suggested that the murder was likely due to the accused trying to claim her property following her husband's death and before her son reached maturity. Such violence against Dalit women demonstrates their extremely vulnerable position within society, their tenuous physical security and property rights, and a lack of social and legal protection. Until society actively addresses the stigma that members of lower caste groups experience and works to redress these and include Dalit women within local power structures, it is unlikely that significant social change will occur. Dalits' inability to secure their economic assets and property and their marginalization within the workforce perpetuates their poverty and inequality. This then has a consequence on Dalit children's ability to access and remain in education. Dalit children are less likely to be able to enroll and then remain in school until the age of 16 or higher due to financial and social pressures which compound one another. Further, they are more likely to be forced into child labour due to economic necessity and a lack of alternate opportunities. Without literacy skills and qualifications, Dalit children remain unable to participate in employment and local governance, especially at any level that would give them power and decision-making roles. The cycle of poverty, marginalisation and discrimination therefore continues. Dalit feminist organisations therefore provide one of the only avenues where Dalit women's experiences is consistently represented and expressed. It is their activism, often in collaboration with larger non-governmental organisations, that helps to provide redress and raise political pressure for their emancipation in some circumstances. This module has introduced the readers to three forms of feminist thought not covered in the previous module. Cultural feminism via the ethic of care versus the ethic of rights. Radical feminism that relies on cultural feminism to argue that the current form of rights as included in law and the adversarial court system are not representative of women's way of thinking and therefore automatically disadvantage them. And Dalit feminism, which develops a theory to demonstrate how lower caste women have not been included within mainstream feminist rights struggles within India and, as a result, are now the least represented, least protected and weaker section of society. This module is now complete. Thank you.